Hi, everyone. Hi, this is Good Evening from Beijing. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to CDTN Global Youth Talk. We know the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China has raised much attention from across the globe. So China's development is deeply embedded into the global economy, and the path that China is pursuing is of great importance to the world. And we want to understand more about what kind of opportunities is likely to emerge during this process, especially for the young people who are the leaders of the future, who will be reshaping the world for us. So who else would be better to talk about what young people think about other than the young people themselves? Now today, CDTN is hosting this special TV show and TV forum, Global Youth Talk, Growing Together with China. I am thrilled to be joined by representatives from the international youth community who will be sharing with us their stories, their thoughts about how the future leads us. And ladies and gentlemen, now let's welcome all of them, those who are on site and those who are online. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, I need to wave to the camera, everyone. <laughs> yes, I'm so looking forward to be hearing from all of you. Thank you for joining us. Now, it is my honor to invite our first speaker of the day. Let's invite Mr. Sun Cheng Hao, Fellow of Center for International Security and Strategy at Tsinghua University. And his topic will be about multilateralism and the youth generation. Welcome, Sun Cheng Hao. Dear friends, I am Sun Cheng Hao from Center for International Security and Strategy in Tsinghua University. It is a great pleasure to exchange ideas with our fellow youth representatives from all over the world. I am a researcher who follows international relations, and my interest in this begins 11 years ago, when I was an exchange student in Brussels. Being the heart of Europe from a Chinese perspective, I felt the difference between my own country and Europe, but more importantly, our commonality, how we are connected, how we share common concerns, and embrace the same aspirations. I started to develop an interest in global affairs, especially China's interaction with the rest of the world. And this curiosity keeps me going to this day. But as a researcher, I also realized the world is changing dramatically over the past decade. Major power rivalry is turning towards stage. Geopolitical risks are testing and threatening interdependence between countries. This situation has affected global cooperation on many fronts. For instance, climate change has become one of the most serious challenges facing human society. Extreme weather has become an important topic in many places around the world. No matter you are in Asia, Europe, or North America, coastal or inland, the disaster and the loss brought by climate change is getting closer to people's everyday life. However, tackling climate change cannot be done by individual countries. It must be done by countries working together. China has called for true multilateralism, actively participated in global governance and promote multilateral cooperation. In the fight against climate change, China is firmly committed to the Paris Agreement and has solemnly pledged to achieve carbon peak by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2060. As the young generation, it is our responsibility to build a better world. There is no denying that the major power game is intense and endangering global cooperation. But this background only calls for stronger solidarity and commitment to more global cooperation. Young people should not be indifferent bystanders, but active promoters. To maintain world peace and development, to fight against climate change and other global challenges, all requires better understanding and joint efforts of our young people worldwide. This forum, organized by CGTN, provides a good platform for us to exchange ideas and understand each other's concerns. As a young researcher, I will continue to work with colleagues at home and abroad and explore more pragmatic and sustainable solutions for global challenges. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sun Chen Hao. Thank you. And that was a great opening for today's forum. Well, next, we would like to invite our next speaker who will be joining us online. That will be Atham Saeed, Central Committee member of the Lebanese Communist Party. He has been closely following the recent dynamics from the 20th National Congress of the CPC. So let's hear what he has to say. 
the Chinese Communist Party held its 20th Congress just a few days ago. Without a doubt, the decisions made at this Congress will have historical significance and an impact not only on China but also on the rest of the world. The timing of this Congress, as well as the decisions it takes for the next five years, will be central to the global transformation process. The Congress, the Congress takes place during some extraordinary global circumstances. The world is transforming, and the current order, the current world order, based on American domination, has begun to change. China plays an important role in the process of establishing a new world order, and it's the only country with a comprehensive proposal for new world order. From the Committee with Shared Future for Mankind initiative to the Belt and Road initiative and the Global Development initiative, all of that are landmarks of a new world that China is creating. So, all this will have a direct impact on, the, on all people of the world, particularly the youth, and especially the youth of the Arab world, who have been subjected to domination, wars, and exploitation for more than a century by old colonialism, Western Europe, and the new colonialism, United States. We want a world based on mutual respect, and win-win cooperation. Cooperation in all fields, in scientific, in economics, in technology, in health, sport, culture, and media, in all fields, broadens young people's horizons and provides them with opportunities for creativity, work, and development. China provides numerous opportunities in this field. And I'm an example of Arab youth who studied in China on a full scholarship provided by the Chinese government and benefit, benefited greatly from this country's experiences. And I hope that I will be able to transfer these experiences to my country. Lastly, in previous and current Congress, China has stressed that it does not seek domination or exploitation for other countries and nations, but rather offer cooperative initiatives based on the mutual benefits. This is extremely important. This is the cooperative foundation upon which we must build the new world. We anticipate that China will play a bigger role in this field. That is what all oppressed people around the world are hoping for. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saeed. Thank you. Now, our next speaker would like to share his views on Sino-U.S. relations. And let's welcome Manolo de los Santos, co-executive uh, director at the People's Forum. Let's welcome him. Hello, my name is Manolo de los Santos, and I'm speaking to you from the city of New York in the United States. And while we live in times of great systemic crisis for the world, we can also say that these are times that are fastly and rapidly changing due to the transformations led by countries like China. And to speak of China today is to be able to speak of the great transformations led by the Communist Party of China, which now celebrates its 20th National Congress. There have been many achievements over the past few years, but I would remark and emphasize that as a young person living in the United States, seeing the contrast that take place, the deep differences between two systems, one that puts people first and another that puts profits over people. Perhaps the most impressive single achievement of the last decade has been China's eradication of extreme poverty for more than 850 million people. Another unmistakable achievement was China's success in managing the COVID crisis. In the United States, more than 1 million people have died due to COVID-19 and continue to do so because of neglect 
and lack of public health care. In the year 2020, more than 60 million workers lost their jobs. More than 100,000 small businesses were sent into bankruptcy. While the U.S. plunged into an economic recession and a healthcare crisis of unprecedented proportions, it was the Chinese government that pursued a policy of preventing such loss of life inside a country of 1.4 billion people. This would have been impossible if it had not been for the policy, the guidance, and the united approach of a government led by the Communist Party of China. That doesn't mean that there aren't significant challenges, but this was a huge achievement. In this period, China has emerged clearly as the second largest economy in the world, with the party leadership outlining a plan so that economic development is balanced and becomes more balanced, is capable of dealing with pollution and climate destruction, and is focused on the question of how do we build common prosperity. This common prosperity that China talks about is not just for itself, but for all the nations of the world. China is offering us a different global vision. The development of Belt and Road Initiative is a stark contrast to the economic globalization scheme that is based on neocolonialism espoused by the United States and its allies. We believe, the people believe, that for this, there is no reason to be at odds with China. On the contrary, the United States has a lot to learn from China. The United States can grow a lot from understanding that the model offered by China, while wholly different, is also of whole benefit to all the peoples of the world. Today, in the United States, but in many parts of the world, there is a growing popularity in the ideas of socialism. Millions of young people want a more just and sustainable world. They want a planet with sustainability and equality. And for that, there's no clear alternative to capitalism than China. China's development of socialism with Chinese characteristics and its social and economic achievements are pointing the way for the world that we want to see in the future. Thank you. That's quite an inspirational speech. Thank you very much. That was Mr. Santos first. And our next speaker is an Indian journalist and commentator who is based in Beijing. Ladies and gentlemen, let's join me to welcome Mr. Shamin Zakaria. We will leverage the strengths of China's enormous market, attract global resources and production factors with our strong domestic economy, and amplify the interplay between domestic and international markets and resources. This is what His Excellency President Xi Jinping said while presenting the work report during the just concluded 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm beginning my speech today citing this quote because in my view as an expat working in China, these words serve as a reassurance that China will continue to open wider and broader to the world. In addition to throwing light on China's remarkable achievements over the previous decade and defining the country's direction for the next five years and beyond, the work report also reiterated China's commitment to upholding true multilateralism and expanding high-level opening up. The work report also stressed China's commitment to its foreign policy objectives of safeguarding world peace and pursuing common development, reassuring the international community that China is a major force for world peace in the geopolitical landscape. China's efforts in building a community with a shared future for humanity over the years have injected new impetus to world peace and development. I'm sure we would all agree to the fact that today, humanity is facing unprecedented challenges and that hegemony and bullying by certain forces are posing great threat to the world order. And it is also indisputable that at this critical juncture, China is rising to the occasion by adhering to its commitment of maintaining global peace, 
stability, and security. In the midst of profound global changes and challenges, China's development initiatives will continue to be a boon for supporting global economic growth and fueling global development while spurring its own spirit of rejuvenation. Last but not the least, in a highly interconnected world, countries can promote peace and preserve the gains of development only and only through common development and cooperation. Thus, China's vision of building a global community with a shared future can lend a boost to global stability and foster progress of all people. Thank you, CGTN Think Tank, for giving me the opportunity to offer my views. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for hearing my views patiently. Please allow me to conclude by expressing my hope that we all can work together to cultivate the virtue of mutual respect, develop mutual understanding, and foster cooperation that benefits one and all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zakaria, thank you. And next, I would like to invite Kyle Hazelsteiner, member of the Youth League of the Socialist Party, Zambia. And his topic will be likely to focus on political education and rejuvenation of the socialist spirit of the youth. Over the past week, the Pan-Africanism Today Youth Sector hosted the first Pan-African Youth Conference in South Africa, attending with 35 delegates from the continent and diaspora, as well as invited guests from Asia, Europe, and North America. It was in this space and in consultation with the attending delegates that we gave thought to the topic of political education and rejuvenation of the social spirit of youth in Africa. I'm going to share what we pinned down. For a long while now, what we have observed in Africa is massive political apathy amongst the continent's youth. But this discontent is with the established or dominant system of politics on the continent. This takes on different expressions, but is seen principally in the turnout of young voters to the polls, stemming from our mistrust in and the ability or will of the established order to improve our lives. But promisingly, what is budding is a renewed hope in an alternative path to shared prosperity. What we've noticed is a growing sentiment on the continent to break away from the economic and political order imposed on it and to advance its own path independently taking inspiration from the socialist constructions in China and other parts of the world. The renewed socialist spirit in African youth is in the main taken from Africa's anti-colonial and independent struggle heroes, historical figures like Kwame Nkrumah, Thomas Sankara, Amilcar Cabral, Patrice Lumumba, and others. Slowly, more and more of Africa's youth are developing salient anti-imperialist and anti-capitalist sentiments and positions. Though as experience teaches us, it's easier to be against something than for something. Herein lies the importance of political education. Concerning our political education, I'd like to highlight two areas that we believe need attention. The first, our political education needs to feature and feature prominently a counter to the anti-Chinese, anti-socialist propaganda, which is largely camouflage xenophobia and anti-black racism. We cannot surrender the consciousness of the African youth to the Western capitalist media and propaganda machine. We need to take full profit of the moment we're in and of strengthening Africa-China relations to broadcast as far as we can the truth of the relationship between Africa and China, one of mutual respect, mutual benefit and shared prosperity. Second, we need to focus more attention on the education of adolescents, that is their formal and political education. As of 2021, 40% of Africans are aged 15 and below. This is an incredibly large portion of the population that we cannot afford to neglect when speaking about political education. We cannot trust that the African youth will stumble onto socialism. We can't leave it to spontaneity or chant. It is only through our deliberate, pointed and coordinated efforts that we will revive the socialist spirit of youth in Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was also quite very um, inspiring speech. That was Mr. Heisel Steiner for us. And next to join me online is Yon Apia Kubi, who is a member of the Standing Committee of Socialist Movement of Ghana. And we can expect that he might be talking about more about the Africa-China relations. Take a listen. The Youth League of the Socialist Movement of Ghana salutes the Communist Party of China, its leadership and the people of China on the success of the 20th National Congress of the Party. 
we are encouraged by the giant strides the people of China have made since the Communist Party, guided by the principles of Marxism-Leninism, was founded in 1921. From a backward agrarian peasant economy and a semi-colonial, semi-feudal society, China has now become a towering giant in international affairs, achieved the status of a super-industrial society and has eliminated extreme poverty. The youth of Africa applaud the people of China, led by the Communist Party for their friendship and solidarity in the most difficult years of our struggle. We note in particular that China provided much needed financial and diplomatic support to the national liberation movement in Africa in our battle against classical colonialism. The sacrifices made by our Chinese comrades, brothers and sisters have yielded significant fruits and today, more than 50 African countries are independent. Africa and China stand shoulder to shoulder in the rejection of all forms of racism and bigotry. We firmly believe that all people, irrespective of their color, language, geographical location, and other attributes are equal and ought to be treated with respect and indignity. The youth being of the socialist movement of Ghana sends this message in the true spirit of friendship and comradeship. We established through the very special relations that existed between Kwame Nkrumah, the founder and first president of the modern Republic of Ghana, and Chairman Mao Zedong, the founder of the People's Republic of China. It is our belief that this friendship will lead to the construction of a new, just, and equitable world in which poverty and underdevelopment will be punished. We completely reject the aggressive designs of the forces of imperialism calculated at undermining the One China policy and plunge the country into a needless war. Under the banner of socialism, we shall work to promote world peace and security. We congratulate the Communist Party of China and the people of China on the giant steps they have, they have taken to modernize the country and salute Comrade Xi Jinping on his election as General Secretary of the Party and President of the People's Republic of China. Wow, thank you. That was Mr. Kubi for us from Africa. Now, switching gears, we have another speaker from the room. Let's welcome Ms. Ting Kwan Chuck, researcher at Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, onto the stage. Welcome. So, as a Chinese person born in Hong Kong in the 1980s, my family, like many, moved to Canada searching for a better life. As I grew up, however, I also began to see that life in the capitalist West, especially for immigrants coming from the global South, wasn't everything that we had imagined it to be. At the same time, even though I grew up speaking Cantonese, I had very little access to information about China and understand what was driving its rapid rise and what it meant for the people and for the world. So two years ago, I finally had the opportunity to return to mainland China as an adult. This was shortly before Wuhan came out of the lockdown and the world went into a pandemic crisis. The pandemic made one thing pretty clear to me, and that is the impressive level of disinformation we hear about China. The China that I read or heard about was completely different from the one that I was living in. The amount of fake news and outright xenophobia made it clear that the media is not neutral, as it actually being weaponized. Indeed, we are living in a battle of ideas over the hearts and the minds of the people. President Xi Jinping talked about the importance of international communication in his report to the CPC's 20th National Congress, and that efforts need to be made to strengthen the country's international voice that reflects the real experiences in China and creates meaningful exchange with the rest of the world. I think this is one of the key tasks ahead. A year after the pandemic hit, China announced the eradication of extreme poverty. 850 million people had been lifted out of poverty in 40 years, 100 million of whom through the targeted poverty alleviation in the last decade. This achievement is historic in the truest sense of the word and is a huge contribution to humankind. But how do we explain these numbers? How do we communicate the stories of 100 million people and why was this achievement barely reported in the international media? I had the chance to visit 
Guizhou last year and see some of these firsthand experiences, meet youth, women, peasants, and party members who are sent for years at a time to live and work in the countryside alongside the poor families. And it opened my eyes. And this later became part of the study we published at the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. These stories need to be told. And it's not about making China look good, but because the world needs it. As China achieved its first centenary goal of eradicating extreme poverty and becoming a moderately prosperous society, the world saw its first reverse in poverty since 1998, with the pandemic deepening existing crises and claiming millions of lives. China's millennial history has been one of struggling against poverty, but we, as people from the global south, shouldn't be condemned to poverty. For this, countries that are also trying to develop and find their independent path need to be able to learn from China's path to modernization, both of the successes and the challenges. So one of my great hopes is that this country can play an increasingly active role in leading the progressive and socialist forces in the world to confront the biggest concerns facing humanity today, from poverty to climate and to peaceful coexistence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chuck, for bringing us your story and how that's going to relate to China's development and enhance how it is embedded in the global background. And next, our speaker is also a lady, Ms. Sherry Chow, who is a columnist and promoter of China's Scandinavia intercultural communication. And she will tell us how she understands the global media landscape. Hello, this is Sherry from Norway. Hi, Ola Samman. As an overseas Chinese who has been constantly encountered with questions like, where are you originated? I'm the witness of the development of the narrative of China. In 1990s, China is still a mystery. There was not much media coverage on China globally, and ordinary people get to know China by movies or just by grapevine. So I was occasionally struggled, uh, given it was a top job to convince my Norwegian classmates that I am not a Kung Fu master and not everyone in China is related to Jackie Chan. Um, the tipping points was uh, in 2008, uh, Beijing hosted one of the best ever Olympic Games, and it seems that astounded the whole world. Starting from that time, China entered the world stage with limelights. A news report on China always hit headlines in mainstream media outlets. As a columnist who always pay close attention to the narrative on China, especially in the context of global media landscape, I found the story of China is largely shaped by Western media. The term Orientalism, uh, described by Edward Said, still applies today. The message from China usually interpreted out of context, and the image of China is depicted in a way that reinforces prejudice and stereotypes. So as a Norwegian with family root in China, I feel obliged to bring about the truth-oriented China story. It is not only about uplifting the backbone of 40 million overseas Chinese, but also fascinating meaningful business and social exchanges globally. Uh, in the past decade, Norway has established a partnership with China with regard to clean energy, maritime, food and beverage, and many other industries. And Chinese EV cars are now running on the main streets of Oslo, and Norwegian salmon fish are on the table of Chinese consumers. So such mutual beneficial relationship only be sustained by solid trust and understanding, which is partly driven by a positive narrative of China, namely a good China story. So when the 20th Party Congress stressed the importance of tell China story well, it does resonate with me. So storytelling techniques are constantly evolving under the age of social media and web 3.0, and it requires the collective effort of traditional media outlets, new media, as well as any individuals who is willing to play a role in this grand mission. To uh, close the presentation, I would like to say that uh, respect to China is in the interest of anyone who would like to see a future of peace and prosperity. And all of us could be an influencer to drive a good China story. Okay, thank you.
Thank you. Very interesting speech given by Ms. Chow. And our next speaker is Halilu Abubakar Muazu, who studied in China and also was the winner of My Dream of Harmony essay writing competition. I guess he's very good at writing, and I'm more curious about what he wants to speak about today. Let's hear it. I am Halilu from Nigeria. I want to use this opportunity to congratulate the president, Mr. Xi Jinping, the CCP, and the entire people of China on the successful 20th Congress. For the country of Nigeria, we have benefited in some of the most important Chinese government's initiatives. For example, the Belt and Road Initiative. In Nigeria, we have problem of decaying and inadequate infrastructure. During these recent years, Nigeria has received support and funding via this instrument or via this policy. And we have started to revitalize, to renovate, and to improve the Nigeria's rural infrastructures, rail networks, industries, and transportation such as the deep sea ports and logistics. Nigeria is hoping to get further support to this type of initiatives in the next phase of the five years annual plan of China. We also hope to have opportunity to be part of the Global Security Initiative, looking at Nigeria as a strategic partner, an important trade partner of China. Nigeria's position geographically in the world is strategic. Nigeria is part of so many multilateral partnerships in the regional bodies such as ECOWAS, also the African Union, and in United Nations peacekeeping missions and efforts to restore peaceful stability in countries that are facing armed conflicts. We hope that going forward, Nigeria's strategic partnership with China will be also in the face of the Global Security Initiative. And for the youth of Nigeria, we don't want to be left out of efforts to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The China's achievement in eradicating poverty for 100 million people is a very good example for us to learn and to study from. And the Nigerian youth have been able to equip themselves with needed knowledge and are also interested to learn further from success stories such as this. So Nigerian youth want to learn more about tech and STEM. They also want to learn new technologies that will help in enhancing e-commerce or logistics product delivery from businesses to customers. Also, Nigerian youth are enthusiastic and are hardworking to work in agribusinesses, processing, and small skills, such as the small and medium enterprises. So we hope that we can also get further support in this regard so that we can contribute to global goals implementation and also to help the two countries because we are brothers. Well, thank you. That was quite some thoughts about, thank you. That was quite some thoughts about Africa-China cooperation. And so let's stay on the topic for a while because I believe our next speaker also has a say on that for he must have some insights. He is the head of delegation of the African Youth in China. Let's welcome Joseph Oliver Menduo. The past decade was extremely extraordinary for China as the country has made historic achievements and shifts in economic and social development, successfully eliminated extreme poverty, and made, and made remarkable achievements in such fields as uh, science and technology and environmental protection, and its role in global affairs be became uh, increasingly important. So China's 14th five-year plan provides a practical and effective development blueprint for China's future economic and social development. And the Chinese economy uh, will shift from a stage of a rapid growth to a stage of high quality development. Such a new stage of development has put the quality of development in a more, uh, would say, a prominent uh, position, effectively transforming the development mode and promoting reforms of quality, efficiency, and dynamic change so that the development results can be better and beneficial to uh, all people. 
In today's world, with uh, major global changes such as the COVID-19 pandemic, both unseen in a century, economic globalization is facing headwinds and the world has entered in a new uh, period of turbulence and change. And against such a backdrop and with the 20th CPC National Congress that concluded very recently, China growth or Chinese growth will promote a global economic recovery and open world economy, economy uh, bringing new opportunities to other countries. And Africa, for instance, is an uh, important strategic partner of China. And during the 14, uh, 14 five year plan, China is planning on realizing a wider but broader and deeper uh, opening up to the outside world, further strengthening uh, its cooperation with Africa and also uh, supporting the construction of the free trade uh, zone on the African continent and providing the uh, with uh, providing African countries with a larger uh, market and more investment cooperation opportunities. China's welcomed um, many African countries to better join the 14 five-year plan process by seizing the opportunity uh, to strengthen the docking of the Agenda 2063 of the African Vision of Action Plan. And I would also mention the pro the pro poor plan for prosperity and development with such platforms as uh, the Belt and Road Initiative and the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. And many key plans and policies that were actually uh, decided at the Congress uh, may well influence Africa-China relations in the future. For example, I would say uh, if we look at the trade value between African countries and China, for example, it increased uh, by it increased to uh, $254 billion last year through both Chinese imports to the continent and uh, export to the continent and import to African countries. So to conclude, uh, Chinese uh, initiatives such as uh, the FOCAP or the BRI have, have stimulated other African development partners to demonstrate their commitment to infrastructure overseas, aligning the initiatives with Africa's own local agendas. Well, that was very well said, right? A great speech, Mr. Mandu. A lot of insights, a lot of thoughts from him. And we will have speakers later on in the day to talk more about China-Africa cooperation. But for now, let's switch gears to a more tech-savvy speaker. Let's invite uh, Mr. Geng Kaitian, founder and chairman of Guanghe Plus Group. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Geng Kaitian from China Speaking. I'm the chairman of Guanghe Plus Group. Thanks, CGTN, for having me. It's been an honor to have the chance to discuss China's new blueprint towards new opportunities. As the Chinese delegate of G21 EA, I'd like to discuss the opportunities in China. Especially, we just finished the 20th National Congress of the CPC, and we all learned from the report. From my point of view, most importantly, in the report, President Xi demonstrated the importance of the innovation technology. Like us, Guangho Plus is a professional integrated company providing smart scenario solutions, such as smart cities, schools, hospitals, and the list will go on. For example, around a thousand schools' dining halls have been intelligentized. It helped build the food safety traceability system and the students' nutrition monitoring system. And as long as they use the system to order a meal, the material loss rate will cut down around 15%. That is how innovation lands. And secondly, speaking of the future, what do we have in China? It is young, talented people. Talented people working hard and enjoying what they have done in the rising country. That is how the report enlightened me. People is the most important factor of innovation in technology. Friends from all over the world, welcome to China to start your career, to enlighten your business. I spent four years of college at the in the United States, being one of the most overall students, and then came back to my hometown and achieved some success. And you, can do, you can do the same thing. And just like a young famous athlete, Ai Lin Hu, Beijing Winter Olympic gold medalist, we made the same Forbes 30 under 30 list back in 2020. And finally, I would like to mention ESG, representing environmental, social, and governance. In July, I was invited to participate in the World Youth Development Forum, 
we talked about how yes, you can change our lives and embrace our social responsibilities. In reform, carbon pick and carbon neutrality have always been a topic. I strongly believe that we all should contribute to promoting international cooperation on youth development and implementing the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Global Development Initiative. That is all for today. I'm Dong Kai Tian. Thanks again for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gunn. And that was an interesting story about technology development here in China. And our next speaker specializes in ecological conservation. He is the editor of Next Hypothesis Journal. Let's hear from Mr. Joe Antinoro. Hello, everyone. My name is Joe, and I'm a member of the editorial team here at Next Hypothesis, an exciting new journal club that looks to give young scientists new and promising opportunities to publish their own research and literature. In a key report to the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China, Chinese President Xi Jinping stressed the importance of pursuing green development and promoting harmony between humanity and nature. Saying that the CPC will accelerate the transition uh, to a model of green development, implementing a comprehensive conservation strategy, um, boosting green and low carbon industries and encouraging green consumption uh, and promoting green and low carbon ways of production and life. This is an enlightening and promising statement declaring to the world that China is resolved to become a responsible actor to tackle climate change and ensure a sustainable world. Therefore, China's role can be of great significance to inject more confidence and certainly into global cooperation on climate governance and control. As the younger generation is concerned about our common future, we are more pleased to learn about President Xi's report and, CP and the CPC's resolve. <clears throat> the recent summer, is one of the hottest ever recorded in human history and so we have come to recognize more clearly that mankind is a community with a shared future and the threat of climate change respects no border. All these challenges are alarming us that is now about time we acted together to reverse the trend and save the planet. China's ambitious goals of reaching peak carbon emissions and neutrality can be a good example and a fresh start. From targets to actions, we need to work hand in hand to encourage implementation of every sector, industry and citizen. Brand new opportunities are awaiting us. We're expected to cooperate with China in technical exchange, industrial chains, financial support and other promising fields. Chinese green development offers us not only jobs in emerging industries such as electric vehicles and biotech, but also entrepreneurial opportunities uh, in relevant sectors with more and more successful examples encouraging us to explore China's vision. Drawing lessons from China's practice, we can bring the latest high-tech outcomes back to our country and help build a real community with a shared future for mankind and humanity. Therefore, we need vision, solutions, and more importantly, collaboration toward our common goal. This is where my team at Next Hypothesis wants to play a part, acting as a bridge between young, bright minds and the older generations, allowing them to publish their work tailored to the world of biology, most importantly, sustainability, biodiversity, and ecology making it possible to introduce potentially novel ideas or simply different perspectives which would allow us to communicate with the senior scientific world and hopefully push for a greener future. So let us join hands with China and embrace a brighter future for us all. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Antinoro, for that inspiring speech. And next, I'm delighted to invite a beautiful lady from Africa onto the stage to join us. Let's welcome Sandrine Wudimana, Director of International Liaison Department at China Africa Business Council. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At the eighth ministerial conference of the Forum on China Africa, cooperation in Dakar last year, both Chinese and African sides committed to um, create a large number of jobs for African youths, promote technology transfer, enhance technical training for youth through platforms such as the China Africa Youth Space Alliance and China Africa Youth Services Forum. Africa is home to the world's youngest population with 70% of sub-Saharan Africa under the age of 30 and 60% under the age of 25. This great number presents both an opportunity of growth, but also a challenge in the case this potential is not realized. So what will China's future blueprint and opportunities might bring to the global youth and to the African youth in particular? Number one, jobs. 
It is estimated that Chinese foreign investment projects created annually some 18.6 thousand new jobs in Africa between 2010 and 2019, therefore making China the leading investor in the continent in terms of job creation. At the same time, according to data from China's Ministry of Education, as of 2018, the number of African students in China exceeded 80,000. While these have been very positive and significant developments, by 2035, there will be more young Africans entering the workforce. Therefore, in order to achieve more sustainable jobs, more can and needs to be done in not only scaling up the number of jobs, but also ensuring technologies are being transferred systematically. Number two, technology and innovation. According to the World Development Report, the labor market of the future will require new skills, including digital fluency, creative thinking, problem solving, collaboration, empathy, and adaptability. This demands African countries, together with its development partners, among which China is an important one, to invest and prepare African youth for the digital economy and the future of work. Traditionally, China has invested significantly in Africa's infrastructure and public sector. However, more recently, Chinese private investors have begun to turn their attention towards sectors such as the Africa, African fintech and other digital spaces, bringing their investment and expertise from success, success stories in their domestic telecommunications and digital sectors. African digital space is already dominated by innovative and creative young entrepreneurs. Therefore, investment in Africa's tech is investment in African youth. There's a very famous African pro proverb that goes like, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. But I'd like to echo today's theme and change it up and say, if you want to grow fast, grow alone. If you want to grow farther, grow together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a great speech. And uh, next, we welcome uh, Michaela Nondo Erskog, a researcher from uh, Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. Let's hear what she has to say. With the conclusion of the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China, the destiny of African people have become more entwined with that of the Chinese people. Firstly, there has been steady growth in the strength of cooperative and collaborative efforts between the African nations and China, largely fostered by the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation initiated in 2000 and the development of the Belt and Road Initiative in 2013, which has covered areas such as financial investment, science and tech, ecology, education, agriculture, infrastructure, medicine and so much more. In the last two decades, China has built more than 6,000 kilometers of railways and roads in Africa, developed nearly 20 ports and more than 80 large power facilities. Technologies such as Yuan Longping's hybrid rice have played a vital contribution in the global fight against hunger, where Africa has benefited from at least 16 grain pilot projects that have seen national yields increase and therefore an increase in food security. Bilateral trade between China and Africa amounted to 254 billion US dollars in 2021, an increase of 35% from the previous year. And China has become the continent's largest trade partner over the last two decades, with trade having increased 20-fold. China has grown to become the source of also 30% of infrastructure funding on the continent in a continent that lacks an annual financial shortfall in infrastructure of 100 billion US dollars. Much of this has been facilitated by an increase in high-level diplomatic engagements, where between 2009 and 2018, we have seen more than 222 diplomatic trips to and from China, and each year we have seen Africa the priority destination, with foreign ministers coming to Africa first every year. These developments have put Africa on a totally different footing in a way that suggests that we in Africa could have a very different trajectory from the one set out by our long history of being colonized and neo-colonized which has bred poverty and deepened inequality. The African continent, who previously was entirely beholden to the politics and markets of our former colonizers, who maintained a hegemonic role over the development agenda of Africa, now has options to, and spaces to leverage our natural and human resources in ways that can benefit our people and strengthen our sovereignty. 
Lastly, Africa sees China as an important source of inspiration in the fight to eradicate poverty. As President Xi mentioned in his speech to the Congress, China has made significant steps with 98 million rural residents having been lifted out of absolute poverty. For us, on a continent where poverty is endemic, where at least one in three Africans live below the poverty line, despite inhabiting a continent with the largest amounts of precious minerals, metals, natural resources, human resources, and therefore drawing lessons from the CPC's leadership in this process is of utmost importance in how we shape our own self-determined project and pursue a development that's in the interest of our people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Skok. And as a Chinese, I'm proud to hear that China's efforts in securing food supply, as well as alleviating poverty, has provided much inspiration for countries on the African continent and beyond. And our next speaker will be uh, offering his perspectives on cooperation between China and the EU. Let's hear from uh, Mr. Gabriel Valkov, chairman of Bulgarian Socialist Party's Youth Union. Greetings. It's a great pleasure for me and the Bulgarian Socialist Party's Youth Union to take part in the Global Youth Forum in China. Thank you for your invitation. First of all, I would like to talk about the importance of the mutual cooperation between the European Union and the People's Republic of China. In the past year, the world got divided into West and East once again. A period which should have been forgotten long ago is returning. That shouldn't stop both Europe and China from further developing their relations that are getting destabilized by the global events. The EU-China Comprehensive Agreement on Investments gains both EU and Chinese investors a greater level of access to each other's markets and better opportunities for the businesses. That benefits the economies of both sides and helps them to develop. China and Bulgaria have a long tradition in political, economical, and cultural aspects, as the two countries have been working together for a long time. Investments from China to Bulgaria are very important for us. We both share a common political past that can be a fundament on which we can step for further developing our relations. Young people in Bulgaria don't know enough about China and Chinese youth doesn't know a lot about Bulgaria. The two countries have rich history, so we have to work on promoting it to citizens of both nations. That way, we can encourage tourism between our countries. We should think not only about cultural, but also political exchange programs for the youth of our countries. As I mentioned before, we have a long political history together that should continue. Investing in new generations is important, and we should have more Bulgarians studying in China and vice versa. All of that will strengthen the connections between our nations. I hope that you had a fruitful week of political discussions and decisions during this Congress. I'm sure that this will pave the path forward and create the future not only for the Chinese Communist Party, but also for the People's Republic of China. Kind regards from Bulgaria. Thank you, Mr. Valkov. Thank you. And our next speaker will be uh, telling us, probably telling us about uh, what he thinks about the future of the BRICS. Now let's invite a speaker from the room, actually, Mr. Marco Fernandez, researcher from Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. Marco. Thank you. I'm Marco from Brazil. The CPC just concluded its 20th National Congress, perhaps the most important in its history for the peoples of the Global South. The reaffirmation of socialism with Chinese characteristics and of Marxism as the guiding principles of the nation is not a mere slogan, but the recipe for success that makes China an example for all developing countries. In the past 10 years, Corresponding to the two terms of the General Secretary, Xi Jinping, China has lifted almost 100 million people out of extreme poverty, more than double its GDP and its per capita income, and life expectancy of Chinese people has reached 78.2 years, 
surpassing that of the US for the first time in history, made huge strides in environment recovery, and set bold decarbonization goals by 2060. We could spend hours talking about China's success, but you get my drift. As Xi Jinping said, China has always been a member of the big family of the developing countries. China has been demonstrating this in practice. Since 2013, the Belt and Road Initiative projects, amounting to a $1 trillion in more than 120 countries. That's so urgent for our peoples. As the 20th Congress, uh, it reaffirmed its commitment to supporting development in the South, helping to reduce our inequality with the North. In the political sphere, China is a protagonist in the main initiatives aimed at challenging the so-called rules-based international order, which you all know are nothing more than a rules-based international order of the USA, which change all the time according to their interests. China helped create the BRICS, which is already discussing the, its expansion. The Shanghai Corporation Organization, which already represents around 40% of the world's population, and is building other international platforms, such as the China Select Forum with Latin America countries and the FOCAC with African countries. The growing aggressiveness of US toward China and other countries of the global south is a symptom of the US decline. It knows that the days of its unilateral dominance of the world are numbered. But this also makes the situation very dangerous because they seem to believe that it's only through wars that they can maintain their hegemony. It's urgent to build a united front of the global south in order to achieve global peace. A few days ago, in a lecture for European diplomats, Joseph Borrell, the European Union foreign policy chief, said that Europe is a garden and the rest of the world is a jungle. And the jungle could invade the garden. Looking back at history, who actually invaded whom? For 500 years, the so-called garden invaded and continues to invade the jungle, plundering, exploiting, and murdering millions of its inhabitants, that is, us of the global south. I, as a Brazilian, I'm proud of being from the jungle, just as I believe that all humanity should share the world's gardens. And those who know China know that Chinese people are also experts in gardening. Xie thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting speech, actually. Thank you so much. That's Mr. Fernandez for us. And our next speaker will be sharing with us his thoughts on the relations between China and the Arabic world. Let's welcome Ghassan Komiya, member of the Democratic Way. I'm Ghassan Komiya from the Workers' Democratic Way from Morocco. Uh, China and uh, the Arab and Maghreb region has had historical relationships that are strong and uh, since hundreds of years, there was a silk road that brought together or connected all trade centers from China until uh, the uh, eastern part of the region. We believe that this relationship has been also uh, had common uh, points, which includes in the contemporary world to fight against the colonizers. Both China and the peoples of the Arab and Maghreb region have been fighting imperialist uh, penetration and colonization. And also, they are facing the same challenges nowadays regarding the Western hegemony and the unipolar world. We believe that uh, the uh, future is at the hands of our peoples. And there is a big need to join all our works together in, to, towards uh, eradication of imperialism, of the uh, Western hegemony, and also for building a better just world. Regarding the success of the Communist Party of China to its National Congress, we believe that this is a big step forward into reinforcing the achievements that uh, China has uh, acquired, uh, including eradication of poverty, uh, the uh, important development at the level 
of uh, economic and social uh, being of the Chinese people. We believe also that China plays a big role internationally in uh, breaking the Western hegemony and building a multipolar uh, uh, world where the peoples can achieve their national liberation and build their own uh, development. A development that is centered on the people, not a development that is centered on the private capital. Uh, our uh, main uh, objective for, the, uh, for now, we believe, is how to move this uh, brotherhood relationship between China and our peoples into a, a joint collaboration that is based on development model that is for the interest of the people, that is also for uh, academic collaboration on all levels, especially cultural level, in order to break the uh, Western hegemonic narrative and to write our and understand and exchange our own histories, the histories of our people, and also to understand better our cultures, our religions, and relationship between different uh, ethnic groups in our region. This is a big task that we need to do in order to share those experiences, understand better uh, our peoples, and also have built uh, a common agenda for our uh, people. Well, that's, that was some interesting thoughts about uh, China and the Arabic world and uh, what we can do together to achieve a better future. Next, let's hear a young voice from Turkey. Let's invite uh, Kaya Han Chetin, chairman of the Turkish Youth Union. Our Chinese comrades and dear friends from all over the world, we greet you from Turkey, the stronghold of Asia in the westernmost with feelings of respect, love, and fraternity. I am Kayan Çetin, the newly elected eight-term president of the Youth Union of Turkey. First of all, I would like to point out that the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China, convened in conditions where our world is going through tough challenges, is of historical importance not only for China, but also for all nations of the world. Looking at this Congress and what the People's Republic of China has accomplished in 73 years, we feel strong feelings of revolutionary hope and determination. We can proudly say that the revolutionary will of the Chinese youth who took the fate of their country into their hands by embarking on an organized struggle and their determination to establish a new society and country have great similarities with the legacy of ours. It is a historical success line witnessed by the world China's success in eliminating feudalism, division, backwardness, poverty, and in overcoming embargoes and blockades through the phases, respectively, national democratic revolution, socialist revolution, and reconstruction, socialism with Chinese characteristics, and opening up, and many other reform practices achieved under the leadership of the CCP. In the coming period, independent nation states will build the common future of humanity. The successes of the CCP in achieving its second century goals and in the struggle for a modern socialist states are of decisive importance. We believe that the humanitarian, patriotic and progressive values that Turkish youth share, defend and glorify with the youth of China and other Asian nations will make historical contributions to the new sharing civilization of humanity flourishing in all geographies. We express with most sincere feelings of solidarity that we are ready for multi-area co cooperation in order to improve our joint efforts and common will in the anti-imperialist and anti-hegemonic struggle. Thank you, Mr. Chetting. Thank you. Now let's uh, invite our next speaker, and he has devoted his career life to uh, environmental protection. And let's hear what he wants to share with us today. Let's invite Pierre Blanket, Director of Strategic Partnership of Current Solution. Gajahal, welcome everyone. My name is Pierre Blanket, and I was born and raised in a town in Northern Germany near Hamburg. Hamburg is not just an important economical harbor city, but also a sister city of Shanghai for more than 35 years. Curious about the friendship, I chose Shanghai as my destination for studying abroad. 
which turned out to be only the beginning of my very own long-lasting bond with China. In hindsight, I like to believe it was meant to be, or as we say in China, Yuanfen. Since 2009, I visited China almost every year, driven by the hunger to learn more, and my interest for China and its people only kept growing. As a result, I relocated to China in 2017 as a business partner for a global manufacturer and its purpose to make sustainable living commonplace. Thus said, I can only agree that the past five years have been truly momentous and extraordinary. I had the privilege to grow and lead young professional teams of highly motivated Chinese talent to deliver strategic value to the biggest consumer brands within the China market. I developed a sense for emerging needs and their urgency which essentially made me become a creator for sustainable solutions today. Sustainability goals can be found on every larger corporation's agenda, as the concern around climate and environmental issues is strong, and issues of waste and packaging are impacting people's action. But that alone is not enough. We also know that this will require strong government commitment and activations in order to really impact behavior and keep climate and environmental concerns top of mind. There's a lot of space for real sustainable innovations to stand out without compromising on product quality or price. That is why we have chosen China as our base to create viable, sustainable solutions. As stressed during the 20s Party's Congress, promoting harmony between humanity and nature is on top of the to-do list. And we can see a lot of accomplishments have been made around this mission already. The air quality of Chinese cities have improved over time and the forest cover in China has increased by 40% in the past 30 years. So we look forward to expanding China's global leadership in solving environmental problems. When we think about the future, we shall innovate with value in mind. I'm proud to say I'm the husband of a loving and beautiful Chinese woman. Our children will be part of a generation which will, in, which will function as a native bridge to support and connect our two countries' development. I believe in connecting humanity with nature, with integrity, with purpose, and with each other. I believe in creating a prosperous society in harmony with environmental principles. Therefore, I will commit today to bring my behavior and thinking in line with a clear conscious goal to continuously create sustainable solutions which will support the harmonious modernization of humanity and nature. Ganshia Niemann, thank you very much for having me today. Yes, connectivity is all that matters. And let's invite our next speaker, who is a speaker from the, our room, actually, uh, Mr. Matthew Kelly, Yenqing scholar from Ireland. And I guess he will be telling us some, uh, some stories about Ireland and China. Please. Thank you so much. And hello, everyone. My name is Matthew Kelly, and I'm delighted to join you this evening and take part in this discussion. It's a real honor to represent Ireland and to share with you some of my views as an Irish student studying here in China. You know, Ireland is a very small country in the west of Europe with a population of only about 5 million people. But despite our small size, our relationship with China is very significant. And our two countries' relationship has continued to blossom over the past decade with increased collaboration across sectors, increased bilateral trade flows, and increased cross-cultural and educational exchanges between our two nations. I was really delighted to learn during the 20th Party Congress of the important and continuing role of technology in China's development process. President Xi really highlighted some of the immense achievements of Chinese technology across various sectors, from transport to communications to green energy. It is clear that technology will play, continue to play a key role in China's development, and I think that immense opportunities exist for cooperation and collaboration with China in such technological developments. Ireland's economy is really based in the key sectors of financial services, pharmaceuticals, and very importantly, technology. And I believe Ireland has married many unique advantages and unique synergies to offer China for collaboration in both public and private sector projects. As Chinese companies become global industry leaders across various sectors, Ireland's position within the European Union, our English-speaking and highly educated workforce, creates so many opportunities for our countries to engage in cooperation and mutually beneficial innovation. During his address, President Xi outlined that China will expand science and technology exchanges and cooperation with other countries, cultivate an internationalized environment for research, and create an open and globally competitive innovation ecosystem. 
I think that Ireland has a very central role to play in this shared vision for a globally minded future of innovation. And for example, I was delighted to learn last week of Chinese technology leader Huawei's decision to invest over 150 million euro in the development of a cloud computing base in Ireland. Such cross-border collaboration is already an example of this open and globally-minded innovation ecosystem. And this investment by Huawei is a testament to China's global vision, as well as the advantages of cooperation for mutually beneficial development. So as China continues on its path of development through continuing to work together in educational exchange, technological development, and trust-based partnerships, I believe our two countries can continue to learn from one another and continually promote cooperation across sectors and industries to realize this shared future of global and inclusive innovation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Thank you. And next, we would like to uh, hear from uh, Ms. Madeline, while well, she is the marketing and the BD specialist at Influence Matters. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for the organizers of Global Youth Talk and CGTN for giving me this opportunity to share my insights about the outcomes of the 20th National Congress of the Chinese Communist Party. Originally from Indonesia, I received a scholarship from China Scholarship Council to pursue my higher education in Beijing. And now working remotely for Influence Matters, a PR and marketing agency for foreign tech companies in China. We could all agree that prior to a pandemic, remote work is an impossible concept. However, thanks to today's high advancement, technology advancements and innovations, specifically the fast 5G internet, work can be done from anywhere. This is a great life example on how globalizations and technology innovations have contributed greatly to today's inter interconnected world. In connection with the 20th National Congress of the Chinese Communist Party report, President Xi stated that China has joined the ranks of the world's innovators. This claim is further supported by actual data as China is now home of over 300 global unicorns. As someone who has lived in China for a considerable amount of time, I can be a testament as I have witnessed how fast growing and high technology China has become in a considerably short period of time. China's technology innovations has dictated how we live. With marketing being my forte, I have observed how Douyin or TikTok and its short video features have become a global phenomenon in dictating internet culture and also disrupt traditional marketing. As Forbes reported in late 2021, TikTok is so widely used that it has surpassed the traditional global search engine. I have spent the past several years creating impacts for tech and entrepreneurship community in China. I was also the co-director of Startup Brand Beijing, a global community that strives to give startups the education and the opportunities they need to succeed. Hence, as I'm following closely the news around the 20th National Congress of the Chinese Communist Party, I am very delighted to see how the Chinese government's development strategy continues to provide fertile ground for early entrepreneurs to experiment and innovate, promotes cross-pollination and collaboration in making this world a better place. Thank you so much for your time, and I wish you all a great productive week ahead. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you. And now I'm excited to invite our final speaker of the day, Ms. Gisela Sanadas, economist, member of Petro Grande, consultant of International Association for Popular Cooperation. Let's welcome her. So the COVID-19 pandemic aggravated the existing inequalities between the countries of the global north and those of the global south between those that had the resources to face the pandemic and those that had to go into debt, between those that hoarded vaccines and those that awaited them with despair. And likewise, it aggravated inequalities between the most vulnerable sectors of the working class and those who concentrate the wealth of the nations. As an Argentine, I can say that I have grown up in a country that is struggling to get out of the debt trap, the trap of the underdevelopment, 
of the external restriction on growth aggravated by the shorter foreign currency, in particular of the dependence on the US dollar and the power that it imposes on us. I come from a country whose people have a history of struggling seeking for independence, sovereignty, and national development. When I was a student, I argued with my professors who endlessly repeated the dogmas of the Washington Consensus as the only policy guidelines to be applied, hiding behind the fact that socialism doesn't work and that Marxism can only exist in theory, alluding to the end of ideas proclaimed after the end of the Cold War. In this sense, the 20th National Congress of the CPC represents an inspiration for me. As an economist living in China, I'm a witness of the enormous transformation that have taken place in China to the process of economic development, the socialist modernization, and how this has improved people's life and quality. The poverty alleviation, the fight against COVID, and of course, the international aid. Socialism with Chinese characteristics based on Marxism has demonstrated its superiority over Western capitalism. Just to cite a few examples, having 80% of the world population, and thanks to the zero COVID policy, China had less than 0.2% of world COVID cases, lifted 850 million people out of the poverty and went from being a semi-feudal and semi-colonial economy to be the world's second largest economy, in dean of the world growth and another point for international trade and investment. While the US capitalism, which proclaims itself superior, continues to lose economic power, it had a 50% of the world COVID cases, which means that one out of three people in the United States was infected with COVID. And they have now some 38 million people living in poverty, which is 11.6% of its population. How can the West object to Chinese socialism? It has proven its superiority. So, unlike the Western powers that stockpile vaccines for themselves, China has donated more than 325 million doses of COVID vaccines to the world, of which 152 million went to the African countries and 14 million to Latin America. And this is not only an act of deep humanity, but also promotes that here, in this world, we save each other or only a few will make it for themselves. In the same spirit, China is not causing a debt trap to other countries. In contrast, China helps other countries to build industry foundations so that they can eventually have independent modernization, which for countries like mine, this is crucial. Argentina has joined the Belt and Road, for example, this year with agreement worth in $23 billion. This is the same principle that is found in the Global Development Initiative promoted by President Xi Jinping, under the idea that no country should be left behind. That is why I look very favorably at the development of China, which is focused on the well-being of the people, care for the environment, and promotes the hope for a shared future for humanity. China is not only not an enemy of the peoples of the global south, but represents a beacon for the present and future of socialism in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sanadas. Thank you. And I want to give a big thank you to all of you, all our speakers, our audience, and most importantly, our friends and audience who have been following our event online today. Well, we believe that young people are the changers of the future, and you guys will be playing a vital role in a new era. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much once again for joining us on Global Youth Talk on CGTN. Thanks for your time and your participation, and please stay tuned for more to come here on CGTN. Thank you so much. Till next time, bye for now. Now.